Welcome back. Welcome back to An Athlete's Journey. I'm your host, Travis Reed. Today, I got a special guest, somebody who uh, basically taught me so much, you know, in the time that, you know, we we spent playing against each other my first year in Holland. You know, I watched him growing up as a kid. People don't really know, like, he created a dunk. People say I dunk. He created a dunk. <laughs> Ain't no, I don't know anybody besides him that actually created a dunk. And I, exactly. I'll let him explain it, you know, how I how, how came to be. But, you know, he was a person that looked out for me my first year. You know what I'm saying? I really appreciate him, uh, you know, for what everything he did for me. He doesn't know this, but, like, you know, I, I followed his motto, all the things he taught me throughout my career after, you know, he played. And so uh, I want to say, take great pleasure in introducing Mr. Statue of Liberty Dunk Mr. Terrence Stansberry, thank you for, for coming on the show. Well, first of all, Travis, let me thank you. Uh, as I told you before, you know, we all one family. Before me, there was someone else. Then you came after us. And, you know, we happened to cross paths towards the end of my career. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. every time I see a talented young brother who has an opportunity to play ball, follow their dream and get paid for it, then I welcome him with open arms the same way I was welcomed in when I started to play. Uh, and became a member of this basketball family. Uh, it's kind of ironic that you came to the Netherlands, and that was my first. My first, you went to Den Bosch. Mm -hmm. That was my first club in Europe. Oh, okay. See, that was <laughs> both of our first time. My first yeah, time <laughs> too. That, see, that was my first club in Europe, and that was even special because you, know, when you come from the Den Bosch family, people in the states didn't know about it. It was like the Boston Celtics of Europe back in the day of the Netherlands. Excuse me, mm -hmm. back in the day, mm -hmm. they were one of the top eight teams in Europe always playing in a couple of champions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when I got there, they had won like nine out of 11 championships. And I took someone's place and we won another championship. So, <laughs> <laughs> of course, so we, we both champions here, even though you didn't win with that boss. I know no. you won one afterwards. Yeah, but, I uh, won it with the coach of that those teams, the Tom yeah. Bolt. Like, I won no, it with he, him the next year. Yeah, yeah. But he didn't coach me, but he, I had another coach. I had another great coach also at Den Bosch. Okay. Nice American. A very, very good Dutch player. So we got a connection, not only with them Boston beginning, but L.A., mm -hmm. which is what we you know talked about a long time ago. I didn't become a ball player, as I was telling you earlier, in the eyes of most people until I went to L.A. I was mm -hmm. a street ball player in my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, where I was born mm -hmm. and couldn't even make the junior high school team, actually. And my first year at high school, I got cut three years in a row on the first day of practice, after the first day of practice. <laughs> wow. And uh, a lot of people wouldn't believe that, but that's a true story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I was a street baller, and I, and I loved the game, so I just kept working on my game. And the funny thing is, I never got upset when I got cut. I just went and played with my friends and played on the playgrounds by myself and enjoyed the game. So fortunately, when I moved to L.A., mm -hmm. I was lucky. I met the coach when I was registering for school, and the guy asked me, did I play basketball? And I tell you this story, and I said, yeah, I play basketball. So he asked me what middle school or something that I come from uh, when I was going to George Washington High School, George Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. People know about that school. Danzel Washington made a movie about that school. Yep. You know, years ago in the 70s, how mm -hmm. rough it was, how crazy it was. But uh, I told him, I'm from Delaware. And he looked at me, you said you play basketball. You're from Delaware. There are no basketball players from Delaware. <laughs> and I was crushed. <laughs> I was like, I was crushed because I knew I wasn't really a basketball player because I hadn't made the team, mm -hmm. but it was guys in my hometown that I had looked up to, and I knew they were ball players. And my brother, who I thought was a baller, but you know he changed his life and did something else other than ball, which mm -hmm. was how it is back in those days. But he was mm -hmm. a great ball player before he, you know, he, he took a turn, and he mm -hmm. taught me how to play. So I had this chip on my shoulder that I got to find a way to not get cut four years in a row when I try out for a basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> when he asked me to come try out for the team. And funny enough, you know, he happened to be uh, my uh, my teacher, my my Latin teacher in okay. school. Well, my chemistry teacher, yeah, chemistry teacher in school. So he was on me every day. He never saw me play. And then when trial came, I actually made the B team for him where he was the coach. Mm -hmm. and that, mm -hmm. that was the beginning of it. You know, I, I had a really, we had a really nice season that year. I think we were undefeated in the Southern League. Mm -hmm. Crazy L.A. Southern League back then. Manual Arts, you know about it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, no, it went to Manual, so I already know. <laughs> Jefferson. But I did play in the Spring League uh, at the end of the season with a guy from 
he used to play the Manny Hearts, Dwayne Poli. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I don't know him, but like I know the I legend of him, him. Yeah. And I had a, a teammate, David Johnson, who ended up going to Montana. And the the, the, the the senior team, whatever it was, the varsity team, we had three or four guys in, within the next couple of years. They played Division One ball and got scholarships. So we had a good team. Mm-hmm. And when I left anyway, I ended up leaving, going back to Delaware. But in L.A. is where I actually, after practice one day, accidentally <laughs> did the first 360 off of one leg <laughs> and then later coined it the Statue of Living 360. But it was done in George Washington High School, Carver High School, when I was 16 years old. Yeah, that's 16. what I'm saying, man. Like, I, wanted, I always wanted to know that story. Like, how did you create that dunk? <laughs> I was just trying to do the Julius Irving reverse dunk. Mm-hmm. And he kept turning in the air and actually turned all the way around to the 360 and it went in. And my teammates were like, what the hell was that? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. And then I kept doing it. So funny thing is, it kind of disappeared when I was in L.A. And then I moved back to Delaware. And by then, I had grown like seven inches in one year, gained like 30 pounds, but was still quick when I was small because I was like 5'10", 140 Mm -hmm. when I was in L.A. By the time season started, I was probably about six feet, you know. Mm -hmm. By the next year, I was 6'3", and 30 pounds heavier, but still thin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ended up having like a 43-inch vertical leap, so there wasn't a dunk that I couldn't do back then. At oh, that time. okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So I started trying tricks and everything, and then moved back to Delaware and actually played varsity for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after coming from LA, like I, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, yeah, you better be playing varsity in Delaware. <laughs> the brothers that I played against in LA were so good, it was unbelievable. And the funny thing was, after playing against the, the first couple times I saw practice, I was like, I got a lot of work to do. Right. You know, just to stay on the team, you know, first of all, and end up being like a key player on that that uh, B team. Actually, I was like the most uh, valuable player or something like that. And uh, outstanding player. And then when I got back to Delaware with the height, the confidence, I just destroyed everybody. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the only bad part was in L.A. I was playing a guard. And when I got back to Delaware, they put me in the paint. I played oh. power forward and jump center. But I was quicker than everybody and I could handle the ball. Mm-hmm. But uh, and then I ended up playing point guard by my senior year in Delaware because John Thompson had came to see me play when mm-hmm. he heard about me. He heard mm-hmm. rumors about me from people, and one of his coaches followed me for a year. And when he saw me, he said I was not a Division One player because I was playing power forward and center, obviously. Right. And right. Uh, real thin. He didn't know I could handle the ball and defend and do all the other stuff because two years before, I was in L.A. playing as a mm-hmm. guard. Mm-hmm. And killing. Mm-hmm. No, that makes that's how it started. That was the journey. And then Delaware, from there on in Delaware, I was the player of the year and played in a bunch of tournaments in New York and Philly. And I guess you would call that the AAU nowadays. Okay. Was I was going to ask you about that. You know, I know, I don't know how it is back then, but like, did they have like an AAU circuit or anything like that growing up when you was in high school? Well, like I said, I wasn't really a baller. <laughs> so I wasn't on the circuit. I was a street guy, you know, a street baller. And I did remember in L.A. I met a guy, Terrence, and he was taking guys like Byron Scott, you know, those people to Arizona or something like that. But I couldn't go. But he had me uh, work out with him a couple of times and wanted me to come. But then I left. I went back to Delaware, so I never could. Mm-hmm. But my last year after high school, we had a, what you call a Delaware Traveling All-Stars. So you can call that like an AAU. We went to Philly. We went to Baltimore. We went to Virginia. We all up and down the East Coast and played teams. Mm-hmm. And basically, mm-hmm. I would say seven out of ten tournaments, I was the MVP. Wow. But I already had a okay. scholarship then from Temple because I played in a couple of tournaments. And when Temple saw me, USC recruited me, by the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was and I went on a recruiting trip to USC, which was my dream school. And I know you were a UCLA guy, but <laughs> <laughs> you got to understand something. The first time someone told me I could play ball, I had a vision of going to USC and beating LA. And oh, that was in Delaware. Okay, okay, was, of course. You know, that was in Delaware because USC always came on television because of their football and their track. Right, right. And that was towards the end of the John Wooden era. That was, you know, even though they had great players, I loved them. But mm-hmm. I said, this is the best team I want to beat them. So oh, I'd, rather go, okay. I'd rather go to USC and beat UCLA. <laughs> You could have just joined and kept the, kept the thing going, you know? Listen, like, the, Bru- the Bruins didn't think I was good enough, probably. They never even heard of me. 
I got uh, an offer from Oregon, uh, University of Oregon when I was in Delaware, USC mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the beginning, and then a few other people after I played in some tournaments. But U UCLA wasn't one of them. Well, I got when, you. US when USC recruited me, I jumped on the bandwagon and I was ready to go. I was ready to sign until I promised Temple I'll take a visit to Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, my USC visit was interesting. It wasn't what I expected. And uh, mm -hmm. in a sense, I kind of changed my mind when I went to Temple. So that's why I wasn't a Pac-10 player, which uh. was another thing that I wanted to do also. You okay. Know, it was either Pac-10 or Georgetown or Merlin in my head. Right. Uh, but right. I didn't get scholarships from Merlin. And John Thompson told me I wasn't good enough to play Division One. <laughs> and yeah, USC yeah, no. told me I could play for him in Temple. So that's how it was. Now, now I'm wondering, like, after those 10, you know, 10 tournaments and you win his MVP out of seven of them, did he think, you know what, maybe I was wrong, you know? Well, you know, the funny thing is I went to a tournament in, in Baltimore and D.C. after that, and I got MVP, and USC was there, and a bunch of other schools were there, but he he wasn't there. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> he, he wasn't there. He wasn't there. All right, so, so you, you have a tremendous, you know, uh, you know, going at senior year, all these tournaments, things like that. What was your most memorable moment in high school, you know, for basketball? Well, I think uh, two things. The day after John Thompson told me I wasn't good enough to play Division One, my coach told me, you're going to play point guard for the rest of the season. Mm. And I was playing power forward and center. You got to remember okay. that. Right. And the next game, I had like 43 and three quarters. And he sat me down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, and then um, I ended up getting hurt like about a few weeks after that, less than a month after that, dislocated my thumb. So I couldn't play the rest of my senior year. So unfortunately, my team didn't win a championship. But I came back and played in the All-Star games. And like I said, got MVP in like, like seven out of 10 of them. Went to New York, the final All-Star game. I think they had about three or four, four or five guys who ended up playing in the NBA on that team. And I had oh. like 40, 42 or something like that against a team in New York. Oh, wow. But only one other team made the score 20, and we only lost by 11. <laughs> oh, in wow. New York. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, so, I'm assuming New York had like a bunch of great guys. Yeah. They had four or five of those guys ended up playing in the NBA. Man, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, each uh, one, each one, 90, Chinese Nate Archibald. Oh wow! Yeah, that was it. Each one, each one. Tiny Nate. <laughs> I, I was see. A 1980 MVP. <laughs> <laughs> that That's cool. That's real cool. Um, now, what do you remember? Like, you go obviously you pick Temple. So, what do you remember about your first year in college? How was it? Well, actually, it was. It wasn't bad. I just remember dreaming of being in USC all the time when it was cold as hell in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to kick myself. I said, what a fool am I. It's cold, it's snow. Right. I could be right. I could be in Southern California, you know. But um, I actually played a lot as a freshman. I even started after my third game as a freshman. And in those days, they didn't play freshman that much, or they definitely wouldn't start. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Coaches really made you wait. But I, I was fortunate enough where I played well enough that I did get a chance to start maybe 70% of the a year. But my job was to, not to not to score. It was to play defense and pass the ball. Mm -hmm. We had roles back in those days. And I remember him telling me, if you want to play, you get great defense and you can pass the ball. We got good scores. We don't need you to score. Now, mind you, I'm the, the top scorer in the state of Delaware. Right. Having 30 points and all these, what you would call AAU tournaments and getting triple doubles. And then I go to university and they tell me, don't shoot the ball. Just play defense and pass it. Of course, I wanted to go to USC. <laughs> of course, I wanted to go back. <laughs> I, I, I was serious. <laughs> no, I got but, you. I got you. Um, but anyway, it, it all worked out because uh, I was a defensive player anyway in those days, and I was a good passer. Okay. So it didn't bother me. I did whatever it took to stay on the court and what help was, the team. What was the hardest thing that? Uh, what was the hardest thing from? From college, from high school, you know, like what was the, like the biggest, like the biggest challenge you had? I guess the practicing, in a sense, you know, um, practice is really hard every day when you're playing against top players. You know, we had guys from Philly who were good players, um, and coming from Delaware and playing a new position as a point guard, I'd only played 
point, really, about three months before I end up going there on scholarship. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a, an adjustment, but it was just basketball, playing defense, and pass the ball. So practice was hard as hell because I was tired, you know, when you have a coach that wants to kill you. And in those days, we practiced a lot. It wasn't playing up and down the court. It was a bunch of drills, a bunch of conditioning stuff. It wasn't really playing, which I was used to. So that was a hard, but uh, I adjusted pretty well in the, in the shot clock back. In those days, we didn't have a shot clock. So we had to hold the ball sometime on the road for three, four minutes. And that was not easy. <laughs> when, you were, when you were a guy who considered himself a greyhound like me, I wanted to run and get up down the court. Right. And then we played zone. So it was it was difficult. But, mm. you know, I had to do what I had to do. No, in order to, get on, to stay on the court. My thing was, once I first made my team in L.A., I don't ever want to get cut again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to do whatever it took to make sure that I was going to play. No, I understand that. I understand that. Um, so, like, from your freshman year to your sophomore year, there obviously had to be a big jump. So what was the difference between your freshman and sophomore year in college? Well, I knew that I could play because I started to see a lot of guys. You know, I was running to people that I played against in what you would call the AAU all over. Mm -hmm. And – Playing one year, starting as a freshman a little bit and knowing that my role would increase because the coach told me that I could shoot now. And I did. Have a <laughs> you know, I, was, I was one of those guys who wanted to get buckets, you know. <laughs> and uh, we didn't play fast, so I figured I'd get my shots whenever he told me to by steals and fast breaks. But the second year, he told me I could shoot now. So my scoring actually doubled. I think I averaged like six points my first year. Mm -hmm. And my sophomore year, I averaged like 12. So my scoring went up, still a good team. I was confident I was a floor leader. And I actually thought that I was the guy with the ball in my hands, even though we had good players in different positions. Mm -hmm. So I knew that uh, I was a key player on that team, uh, more so than I was my freshman year, even though I played a lot as a freshman. Okay. I played, okay. I played in the, um, the Sunny Hill College League at the end of my uh, freshman year. Mm -hmm. And Joe Bryant... Jelly Bean, Kobe's dad, he was my coach. Wow. And um, he told me I can score. He said, you don't have to pass the ball to somebody else. You can score. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what he told me. And I was like, no, I like passing. It's okay with me. And he said, but when you get it, score. So I tell people, I used to tell people all, all the time, before Kobe's dad taught him how to score, he taught me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fact. And, and, and not only that, Kobe, his sister, his mother, his dad, and his granddad used to be at every game on Saturday watching us play. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. For, three years, for, for two years, no, three years when I was in university, I think. Yeah. Two years. My freshman year, my sophomore year, my junior year. Yeah. Three years. And we won two championships with him in the summer league. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, after I think the next year, I ended up being like the top scorer in the league also. And then my junior year was my breakout year. I ended up being like number seven in the nation in the NSA scoring. It all had a lot to do with Kobe's dad first, Jelly Bean, in the beginning. And then, of course, we changed coaches my junior year when John Chaney came in to Temple. And oh, that was, his, oh, that was your junior year was his, his first year? Yeah, my first two years were with Don Casey. He recruited me and Jim Maloney, Jay Norman, those guys. And then uh, my junior year, John Cheney's first year's coach in Division One, he came. And we had three key players hurt that year. So John it was handicapped his first year as a Division One coach. So he told me, don't pass the ball to nobody. Shoot the ball. <laughs> 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 and, and you're, never, you're never getting the rest. You better be in the best shape of your life. You ain't getting off the court. So I actually had an NCAA record my junior year, 40.5 minutes per game. Wow. I missed seven minutes the entire season. I came out once for a concussion when I dunked it for one minute, another time for a concussion when I dunked it for three minutes, and another time after I had like 38 points or something like that, he gave me a rest. Only came out of three games the whole season. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is a heck of a thing to be like, okay, you know, I'm only going to – you're only going to come out three games the whole season. Three – look, this – Seven minutes the whole season. That's crazy. That's crazy. And when they were playing boxing ones, triangling twos, one, three, one, four, court press. And then when we were on the road up by four or six points, coach looked at me and said, 
no more shots. And I'm like, four to score? Oh, God. <laughs> I was tired as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's crazy. Was that still pre-shot clock? Pre-shot clock. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. We didn't have a shot clock until my um, senior year. Because mm. we had junior year, they put in the three-point clock, the three-point shot as an experiment in our conference in Atlantic 10 back in those days. Uh -huh. And uh, so we had it my junior year. And actually, that's the year I think maybe me and another of my teammates, Jim McLaughlin, I think we led the nation in three-point attempts, him and I. Oh, you was on the same team leading, leading the conference in three-point attempts? Yeah. And then the next year, we ended up getting a guy um, coming out of Philadelphia, uh, Nate Blackwell, who was like one of the top players out of Philly who could shoot it, who was a guard. And they took it out of the conference because <laughs> We had those two guys back from the year before, and we brought in the top shooting freshman. But I think the people in the conference didn't want us to have an advantage, so they took out the shot clock. I mean, put up, took out the three pointer and put in the shot clock. In the oh, okay. So they only yeah, still had, like, twos, but yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, well, I think we had like thirty-two second uh, shot clock or something like that. So they took out the three pointers. They stole that from us and just gave us time. But we <laughs> we ran through our conference that year anyway. Okay, okay, okay. Did you go to the NCAA tournament and all that? Yeah, well, my first two years at Temple, we went to the NIT because they only mm -hmm. had like 32 teams in the NCAA. People don't know that in our conference, they would only take the champions of the, the playoffs. Uh, oh, so, yeah, like, no, okay, not even league champions, just the champions of the, of the no, tournament. No, we were, I think, in first place in the league my freshman year and maybe tied my second year, one of those years, and we ended up going to the NIT because we lost in the playoffs. Mm. And then... Um, my senior year, we were at, and I we were um, undefeated in our conference. That's when we ended up playing Michael Jordan and those guys, St. John's, you know, and then Michael Jordan. But we lost in our playoffs. So I think we were, I think we only had two losses that whole year, three losses or something, like 24 and three or something. But we got invited to the NCAA tournament. So we played then. So I played postseason three out of the four years. And if you look at, it was 16 teams in the NITs. And 32 teams in NCAA, it was 48 teams playing postseason back then. You could say three out of four years, we would have been in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> the way the rules are, the the are, you know, the way the rules have changed in yeah. the last 35 years. Because I'm like, man, only 32 teams? Yeah, only 32. And in some conference, it was only the conference champion huh, in the playoffs, mm -hmm. not even in the regular season. That's crazy. Yeah, it was it was no. different in those days. You probably would have went all four years, to be honest. Like, cause in the tournament, they had the bubble. No, team. what happened that the third year when John came, we had three players out, so we kind of struggled. But we did go to the playoffs to the championship game and almost got to the NCAA tournament. And I think our conference was really pissed about that because West Virginia had a great team and Rutgers had a great team, and we were like the mediocre team because we were struggling. But we won like six games in a row at the end mm -hmm. and got all the way to the finals and. The second leading scorer on that team, Jim McLaughlin, he broke his finger in the semifinals, but we ended up winning it. And then in the finals, we had to play West Virginia with just me as the scorer. And <laughs> so we ended up losing that game. So we didn't get to the NCAA tournament. No, I got you. I got you. I got you. Now, I guess, you know, having all that success, what would you say your greatest triumph was in college and your greatest failure? Ooh. I think the, the biggest failure was probably losing my senior year in the NCAA tournament to West Virginia. In my junior year, losing to West Virginia in the finals. I mean, not, not in the NCAA, but our, our conference finals, conference tournament, both times we lost to those guys, which really bothered me for a long time because uh, West Virginia was my nemesis. I think my sophomore year also. No, no, my freshman year. My freshman year in NIT, we lost to West Virginia in West Virginia. And we lost to West <laughs> Virginia in... We lost to West Virginia and Philadelphia at the Spectrum my junior year in the conference tournament. We, we, we went to the NCAA tournament. We lost it in my first year. We had went to New York to play in the NIT Final Four. And we lost to them my senior year when we were undefeated in our conference. Top 10 team in the country, number 11 in the country. And we lost to them when a guy shot a jumper in my face in the final seconds. The day I became the Temple's all-time leading scorer, and they never gave me the basketball. Oh, they didn't stop the game, and they didn't give me the ball. So it was heartbreaking, to say the least. <laughs> no, I imagine. I imagine. And a, and a guy shot a jumper in my face to beat us. But I redeemed myself the next game. We played St. John's in an NCAA tournament, and I made the jumper to win the game to play oh. against Michael Jordan the next game. 
So okay. Everything. All so, right. All right. <laughs> That's right cool. Failure, right after failure, you have success when you go to the NCAA tournament and you you make the shot to beat someone else. No, so that's course. how it was back in those days, you know? It's mm -hmm. kind of crazy how that happens when you think about it. No, I was hard. But still never got that ball when I became Temple's all-time leading scorer. <laughs> never got <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Nah, man. I would have been like, they should just mail you that ball. Give nah, you they a ball of size saying how many points you was, you know, at that time. They hated us, man. Nah, I got you. <laughs> what would you say your biggest lesson you learned in, learned in college? Well, I think for most of us, when you leave high school and you come from the inner city, is uh, perseverance to to strive to continue and be successful in life, regardless of how difficult it is. Um, you know, coming from the inner city, not even having a scholarship in hand as a junior in high school, and until I went to LA, I didn't even think I would be playing basketball in university. Uh, getting to Temple, knowing how difficult it was to get there, and then realizing that you can be successful meeting people from all over the world, having an opportunity to travel, and knowing that uh, whatever you encounter in life, any obstacle you can overcome it after you uh, go to university for four years. In those mm -hmm. days, where you come from, huh? in the inner city, you know, one of the things that I tell my good friends, I was in LA, I almost got shot three times when I was there in one year. I had guns pointed in my belly, in my stomach, in my side. Wow! And luckily, something happened where no bullet went off, and I got away. So, lessons. In those days, you're thinking, if I live to be 21, I made it. Right. <laughs> if right. you live to be 18, you made it. You know, in my head, I was like, if I can get past 16, I made it. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Man, that's crazy. So okay, yeah, that's okay. Now, I guess my question, my next question would be like, you have all the success at Temple. Temple's all-time lead scorer, you know, doing all these great successful things. How was the process after uh, college? How was your NBA process like uh, like to you for yourself? Well, it's kind of hard to explain how uh, different times have changed in a mm -hmm. sense, because uh, even in my junior year when I was number seven in the nation in scoring, in my head, I wasn't one hundred percent sure. I percent sure that I would make I would make it to the NBA mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it was different in the the way they judge players. You know, they didn't judge a guy on what they would call potential. They judge you on what you were capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And that was the only year we struggled. We started to lose that year because of injuries and not winning a lot of games and that not playing postseason. You think no NBA team thinks you're going to be able to help. Them. But my senior year after winning a lot of games, getting to the NCAA tournament, um, getting invited to the Olympics, getting invited to the Pan Am trials the year before, I knew I was one of the elite players in America, which mm -hmm. meant basically you were one of the elite players in the world. So I was confident and uh, played in a few postseason tournaments my senior year as well with the top seniors, mm -hmm. made all tournament in every one of those. So I knew in my head that I could play and I was going to be a top player. In university, I could play in the NBA, and that's how it usually went. I just had to wait for it to happen. And fortunately, I was selected in the first round, but by the wrong team, as you would say. My agent <laughs> told me before. My agent told me in advance, if you go number 15 to Dallas Mavericks, it's the worst thing in the world. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> that's the best thing. The earlier you go, the better. He said, no, that's not how it is. And boy, was he right. <laughs> he was 100 right. And, and, you know, it's hard to explain that to people. But I was selected by a team that didn't want me, but they knew the other teams wanted me. So they were going to use me to get rid of somebody that they made a mistake on from the past. Oh, mm -hmm. so they was going to use you as a trade bait with somebody to go to right. somewhere else. You know, a so funny thing happened like a couple of weeks ago. One of my boys hit me up and said, do you know you on a list of people that say general managers made worse mistakes, NBA draft choice, you were selected before John Stockton. Because John Stockton went 16 in the first round that year. I was 15. Okay, okay. I only went to visit one team uh, in those days, and it was Indiana Pacers. They had the 18th pick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they told me, we want you, we really want you, but we know you're not going to be around at the 18th pick. So because of that, they ended up taking Vernon Fleming. 
with the 18th pick. Mm -hmm. But the night before the draft, the Utah Jazz called me and told me, look, if we draft you, are you willing to come play for us? Because we had Dominique Wilkins. He didn't want to come play. I said, are you crazy? I'm going to be the first first round draft trick choice born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware, mm -hmm. make it to the NBA. I'm going wherever, whatever team takes me. First round, second round, I'm going. Right. So right. I was selected by Dallas. Went out to visit, came back home. They never called me. I ended up sitting at home waiting in training camp, waiting for my agents, something to make a deal happen. It didn't happen. So I ended up calling the team myself, negotiating the deal. Got there, played in my first preseason game against the Indiana Pacers last five minutes, the fourth quarter at like 12 and five minutes. And a key shot to win the game. In less than a week, I'm traded to Indiana Pacers, even though they drafted a guard with the 18th pick. Story, <laughs> 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 man. But you know, when I got to Dallas, it was a nightmare because okay. it's the first time I ever ever played for a coach. And I ain't gonna say his name because rest his soul, he did. First thing he said to me, your ass is mine. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing he said to me, his first words. <laughs> and I, look, yeah, I don't care about what happened with the agent. Your ass is mine now. And I'm looking at this guy like, how's that possible? Right. You go to the NBA, you respect every coach, every player you ever played against, and you get to the NBA, and the first thing comes out of this coach's mouth after he shakes your hand is disrespect. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. But that's how it was sometimes back then. You meet people, regardless of their reputation as a coach and how good they were, it depends how they treat people, huh? And that's what this guy said to me. <laughs> man, that's crazy. That's crazy. You know, that's, I mean, that's hella crazy. And then, and then he made me go outside and run in like 95 degree weather heat in in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, wherever we were, I think. Maybe Dallas, or whatever. Dallas, Texas. I was getting taped to practice. And he told the trainer, take his ass out there with his ankles taped in basketball shoes and make him run his mile because everybody has to run a mile before they practice. And then clocking. I was so pissed. I ran with those basketball shoes and ankles taped by myself. And when I came in, I had the second fastest time. And then I looked at him and boy, did I bust some people that day in practice. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine. I imagine. Wally Fly, Orlando Blackman and all those guys there, they would look at me like, oh, we got a rookie here. <laughs> 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 then I'm gone less than a couple of weeks later. <laughs> hey, I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you saw the business side real early in the NBA. Oh, when I got traded, the day I got traded, I'll tell you a story. It's funny. I got traded with a guy called whose name was Billy Garnett. And he was drafted, I think, top five or something a couple years before. And I guess they thought he could outplay Mark Aguirre and a guy by the name of Jay Vincent, who were playing like forward at the time, too. And both of those guys were killing every day when I was there. And Dale Ellis was on the team. He was doing okay. But we had Mark Aguirre, man, and, and, and Jay Vincent. Those guys were like nice players on that mm -hmm. team. And, and Rolando Blackman. So after we play against the Pacers and I played have this good game, I'm excited because, you know, I showed him I could ball in my first ever NBA game with only a few practices under my belt. That morning, the coach is screaming at me like crazy. Like, I ain't doing nothing right. And I'm like, what's wrong with this guy, you know? Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, don't worry. You his rookie. He going to be on you. That means he likes you. When practice is over, they, they tell me I got to go to his hotel room to meet with him. I get in the room. He's standing in the back of the room looking out the window in the suite. And I think the guy's name was, was it Norm Sanju or something like that, who was a general manager, opened the door. He said, come on in, Terry. You know, you're a really nice player. We like you. But, and then the coach turns around, yeah, but we don't need you. And uh, you got traded to the Indiana Pacers with Billy Garnett and you got 48 hours to get there. Wow. The door wasn't even shut. Listen, the door wasn't even closed when they let me in the suite. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at him like, what? <laughs> I just killed <laughs> and okay now you send me to the team that already drafted a guy with the 18th pick in the same position as I play right 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 but they, right but the thing is they're getting rid of Billy Garnett who they didn't want mm -hmm. so so Billy Garnett walks through the door because they didn't shut the door and they look at him and he looks at me he's like and what what 
And they said, you and Terrence got traded to Indiana. You got 48 hours to get there. Billy looked at them and said, fuck you, excuse me, and walked away. <laughs> that was my welcome to the NBA, man. It was crazy, man. When I say crazy, <laughs> it was crazy. No, yeah, imagine, man. That's crazy. I mean, coming from Temple, having a coach like John Chaney, tough, respect, you know, Casey, mm-hmm. playing with guys like Joe Bryan and Sonny Hill in, 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 the, in, the, in the Bacon League before you get to the NBA in the College League and the Sunny Hill High School League, all this respect. And then you get to the NBA and first thing you hear, you know, as is mine, and then 48 hours to get there and then guys cussing out the coach. That was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this is a different, this is a different situation this, right here. This is a different world, brother. This is another world. This is something that, that uh, I didn't expect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So obviously you're in the NBA, you, you're on Indiana, right? Right. And, and, and it's, it's in 1986 or 85 when you went into the dunk contest? Well, actually, I was in it the three years that I was in the league, 85, 86, and 87. But okay, 85, so 85. Okay. 85 is in Indiana. And the funny thing about Indiana was, I'll give you a Georgetown thing about that, because the first practice, I left right away. I didn't wait 48 hours. I went to the hotel, packed my bags, got a plane, and I was in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. So the next day, the next day I arrived in Indiana, well, I arrived that night in Indiana, and the next day, I'm ready to go practice. Right. So I had contact the team, and I'm ready to practice. I walk into practice, and it's a guy in there with number 43 jersey on, which was my number at Temple. Mm-hmm. And I think he wore 43 when he played for Georgetown. He was a good player. A Georgetown player. <laughs> Guard. <laughs> I ain't going to say his name. He was a good player at Georgetown. Right. He was a defensive, defensive hawk, a defensive stopper, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I liked him, too, because Georgetown was one of my teams anyway in high school on the East Coast. I, I really loved Georgetown. So I see him, and I see number 43 on him, which was my number, and they just gave me a jersey. And, of course, it's a week before the season's about to start, the regular season. It's only seven days before the season starts. So normally you think you're going to be on the team until they made that crazy trade. So what happened was I had to go show this Georgetown player that that number's going to be mine tomorrow. <laughs> and if me and you fight for the same position, <laughs> you got to go. Right, right. Of course, of course. I come to practice the next day, and I got number 43 with my name on the back of my practice jersey. And I didn't oh. see him then. And then oh, they the released him that after that day. That, that's crazy. And then Billy Garnett came the day after. So he, Billy didn't come the first right oh, away. Oh, OK, 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 OK. I, I was there. It was crazy, man. But, um. That year, I ended up having a pretty decent year and started some games as well. But during the All-Star game, Charles Barkley was invited to the dunk contest. Mm -hmm. He was also drafted that year with us, with Elijah Charles Barkley, Mike, and all those guys. And for some reason, he didn't want to do the dunk contest. So because it was in Indiana, they asked me to be the replacement. Okay. And when they asked me to be the replacement, I knew I could dunk. I had a bunch of dunks that I hadn't, I've been doing at Temple and, you know, used to show in the hood, but never really been in a dunk contest before. Right. That's the thing. I had never been in one. And I get to Indiana and they invite me for the dunk contest. And then I just said, look, I got stuff I was doing since I was in LA at 16. <laughs> <laughs> and a few more tricks where you throw the ball up in the air, you do all that. So I did a bunch of things that people didn't see before that were creative. Maybe they were done in the past before me. It's possible a lot of it probably was. But I think in the 1985 dome contest, that was the second year they had it. The third year they had a dome contest, but the second year after they revived it. Mm-hmm. They had it in 76, I think, and then they, 75 or 76, and then they revived it in 84. And then 85 was the second year of the, the revival mm-hmm. of the, the NBA dome contest because they had an ABA before. Mm-hmm. And I ended up showing them some dunks that people were like, where'd that come from? And I was like, man, it's playground hood dunks. You would watch the Tarva after practice dunks. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that I used to do at Temple when practice was over when I was mad, when I wasn't playing, when I was a freshman. <laughs> oh, see, there you go. There you go. Yeah, that's how it was. That's what happened. So I ended up finishing third behind um, Dominique Wilkins and Mike finished second. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I finished third doc- in front of Dr. J, Larry Nance, and Clyde Drexler. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what a lot of people didn't know was for 20 years, they didn't show the full dunk contest. 
Oh, I didn't know Mike that. Wasn't to, Mike wasn't supposed to be in the finals that year. Oh, so they, 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 you know, okay. I love, I love Mike. I love Mike. I was crazy about Mike, you know, because Mike was like our era, my guy. But they had a rule where Julia Serving and Larry Nance, the two previous winners of the Dome Contest, got automatic buys to the second round. Mm -hmm. And then the other guys, they took two, no, three, I think three from the um, from the other round, and they would go to the, the second round. So it was supposed to be Dominique Wilkins, Clyde Drexler, and then Mike and I was tied, I think. Yeah, I think it's that, yeah. Because Doc, Dr. J and Larry Nance, I think, were already there. So Mike and I had a, had to have a dunk off right. in Indiana. And we flipped the coin. I won the toss. So I told him to go first. Uh -huh. So he went and did a dunk, and they gave him a 42 out of 50. So they do show the part where I run to a crowd, and that's like the first posse where I go to, like, my brother, my cousin, and people and ask them what to do. And then yeah. I run back and do a dunk. But they showed that like 20 some years later, I think, to everybody. Mm -hmm. They showed it recently, I think, but the world didn't see it. So I did my dunk and I got a 46 out of 50. Mm -hmm. Obviously, 46 is more than 42. Yep. So Mike shook my hand and congratulated me so I can go to the next round. But by the time I turned around, they announced on the intercom, we both go to the next round. <laughs> so Mike was considered the goat before he was the goat. <laughs> right, right. That's what I was like. Oh no, no, Mike got to go. He got to get in this final. Yeah, yeah. But well, Mike was Mike was nice though. You know, he, what happened was he was starting off slow, and then he always would finish strong. You mm -hmm. know, he came up with some, some really really nice stuff. So that's what happened in '85, and in '86. If you want to go there, that's when it was Spud and Dominique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Mike, Mike was hurt. He hurt his foot. And uh, I was third. And then Jerome Koshy was fourth. We had a dunk off, and I beat him. And uh, he ended up being fourth, and I was third. And my third year, year, I got hurt like a month after the dunk contest was over. So that then my NBA career was over, basically. I was, it was in Seattle, another team I got traded to. I, it seemed like everywhere I went, there was a dome contest. I got drafted <laughs> by Dallas. My second year is in Dallas. I get traded to Indiana. My first year is in Indiana. <laughs> I get traded to Seattle. My third year, the dome contest, the All-Star Games in Seattle. Right, so, right, right. It's kind of crazy. So I ended up finishing third there. And a month later, I, I ran to a wall in practice in Cleveland, hurt my back and everything, then went on injury reserve. Before you know it, my NBA career was over. When I came back to training camp, had some personal things that had to deal with, you know, I had a son who died and uh, I wasn't really there. And then I just waited a few months, played about two weeks in the CBA, three weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a game at Temple and Rolly Massimino, legendary coach, passed recently a few years yeah. ago. Yeah, no, he gave, I, yeah. yeah. He gave me the, the phone number. He said, what the hell are you doing here? Because in those days, we, we didn't have like Sports Center the way you guys have it, the way right. it is now, we have all these channels. You, you, you might have something in the sentence when guys got cut and all the games weren't televised, publicized back then. So a lot of mm -hmm. people didn't even know that I was not in the league mm -hmm. until I go to, I show up at a temple game and he's like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> he gave me a number. He said, when you want to play ball, go to Europe. You can make money in Europe. And a lot of his players, a lot of Big East guys are in Europe. And he knew me because we used to be Villanova three out of four times. <laughs> 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 So he knew me as a top player. So he gave me a number. And it happened to be the president of Den Boss and someone in Belgium that I didn't even call. I just right. called Den Boss. By chance, I called the Netherlands. And a couple weeks later, I just told the CBA, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. Got my passport. I was on a plane in the Netherlands meeting Dutch guys that said hello to me. And then they were speaking Dutch in, in, in less than two seconds later. So I was in shock. Like, what they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> My brother saying hello and how you doing? And next thing you know, I he hops up some slobber. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I'm sure you saw it. You no, like, no, it? that's how it was. <laughs> they they spoke good English for the most part, but like they would go back to that the Dutch, yeah, you know, no, talk definitely. speaking Dutch as well. Yeah, but it, that was a that was really, I think, the first 
Okay, being in Seattle when we won was nice because it was a great team. In Indiana, we had like a young team. We were the youngest team my rookie year. Struggled. In my second year, we still had a younger team as well. And we struggled. And I started and then came off the bench. So I started sometime, came off the bench. My second year, I was starting for like a month. And then all of a sudden, one day the coach tells me he's going to have me come off the bench because they gave this guy all this money and they traded for him. But he couldn't outplay me in training camp. So I'm like, why should he take my place? <laughs> I'm killing him now. I'm playing, I'm playing him now. Right, but that's how right. it worked. So then I ended up being a starter, playing very little minutes towards the last end of the uh, couple of months of the season. So which was crazy. I think I probably was the, the only two two guards starting in the NBA that was averaging less than 30 minutes that year, probably. Yeah, when I was starting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> But uh, and then I went down even less, then less and less. So I knew I had, I had to get out of there. Luckily, I got traded to Seattle, and it didn't matter how much I played in Seattle because we won. And they brought in Dale Ellis. He ended up having his great season, breakout year after sitting on the bench three years in Dallas. Nate McMillan, you know, Xavier McDaniel's, Tom Chambers, late great Maurice Lucas, and Alton Lister. I mean, we had a crew. So no, that that is happy. a squad right there. That's like you know a bunch of dudes that can hoop. Yeah, you know, my first year we had Clark Kellogg and we had Herb Williams, who were wonderful guys and really great players, and, and Jim Thomas from Indiana and Vern Fleming and all that. But we struggled, so it was, it was kind of hard, you know, to walk around and be proud to be a ball player. I think that was the first time that I was kind of like, am I really a basketball player? Losing all the time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I wasn't used to, you know. Right. And then in Seattle, when you win, you know, you can stick your chest out, you feel good. Right, uh, right, right. About yourself and your situation. But then boss was different. It was a lot different. Coming to Europe, huge adjustment, very professional. Five of my teammates had played, four or five of my teammates had played NCAA basketball in the States and started. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. We talk about in 1980, in January, when I went there, you had guys coming in with breakfast at McDonald's in USA Today in the morning practice mm-hmm. in Europe. So that was an easy way to adjust. Yes, yes. You know, it was almost like uh, being back at the crib because everybody was talking about the states where they played in New York or played in in different places in America. All these guys had played, huh? Yeah. And yeah. they were winners, and they were used to winning, and they expected to win. Um, winning is what they wanted, nothing less. So I was happy. Um, see, yeah, and like I said, I know, the, you know, like when I went there, we was young. My first, It was my first year, and you know, like I said, Playing against you, I was like, man, that's, you know, I remember me and my best friend, you know, he was like, man, that's Ted Stansberry, man. He created the dunk, man. I remember when we <laughs> first played y'all. He was like, man, I can't believe it, dude. The Statue of Liberty. And so I showed my teammates, because they didn't, they were super young. They didn't really know who we were. And then I showed them a video. This is him, dude, in the NBA dunk contest, you know, or whatever. And it was like, what? That was him? I was like, yeah, man. Yeah, but. But that was another life. I remember when you came because the hype about you was like, oh, we got a, a reincarnation of Charles Barkley. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but you know, that, that kind of, that kind of, which was a, a good thing to say about a young brother coming right, in. Right, right, right. You were a beast. You were a beast <laughs> at the time. Unfortunately, the Netherlands had went through this phase, you know, Belgium and Netherlands went through a period where they had good money mm-hmm. and then they had financial problems. Mm-hmm. And you came to Den Boss right at that period where they had these financial issues. And I came at the end of my career because I was supposed to play in Belgium mm-hmm. uh, the year before at the end, which was going to be my last year playing as a pro. But something happened with the management where they end up tripping and tricking me and then cut out my whole salary using a Dutch agent to get his Dutch players in. He probably was your agent. I ain't going to talk about it. <laughs> and he gave it to a young guy at the university, gave him my money. And then I had to find a team in the middle of the season. I ended up going to the Netherlands, going to Weird. Mm-hmm. And they were struggling all year long. And I helped them make the playoffs. Yep, yep, yep. I didn't make the playoffs that year. And then next year, they signed me back. And I was going to retire. And that's the year you came. Okay, okay, the, okay. The, the, the second year when I came back, I said, I'm going to retire. I'm done. Because guys are catching alley-oops on my head. Uh, <laughs> I had turned 40, I had turned 42 and I was like, this is enough. And then of course the money had went down dramatically from two years before when I was in France and then in Belgium the year before where I had another salary. And then I just came to help this team because I knew the management. 
Right. But then they wanted me to play one more year. So I said, okay, I'll play one more year. And then seeing guys like you come in, I'm like, man, I can't play with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, can my, I can get my number. I can get my stats. I actually think, I, if I remember correctly, we did have a better record than y'all did that no, year. No, no, y'all did. Y'all were, y'all were better. Y'all beat us like three three out of four <laughs> during the season. Yeah, we kind of like put it on y'all. But the thing was, we had a rookie coach, and he, he did a good job. We good day. But in the playoffs, for some reason, he decided he didn't want to play me. Mm-hmm. If you remember that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In the playoffs, he decided he ain't going to play me. He's going to play some of the younger guys. And I figured, okay, I'm old, so why not? You know, I had no. already been through some stuff before when I turned 37 in Greece, when I'm killing and then they playing young Greek guys. And they were good too. <laughs> right. But the guys that were playing in Holland, they were okay, but they didn't know how to play in the playoffs. Right, right. Because they yeah, they never won. Yeah, yeah. Then they, you know, they didn't know about the playoffs. And, you know, of course, that – that agent, that Dutch agent had total control of all of that. He was trying to get these guys get stats to get get jobs next year. He didn't mm-hmm. care about a guy like me who wasn't his agent, wasn't his player. So I just sat there and said, okay, we're going to lose in the playoffs to a team that we better than. Yeah. And then I'm no. like, I'm really no. done. I, I said, I'm finished. <laughs> and I'm pissed <laughs> about that. <laughs> but, you know, you know, at least that's how it happened. Then. And that's, that's what I was thinking at the time. But that's life. You know, Daryl Green was one of the young point guards on that team. The next mm-hmm. year, I ended up talking to a friend of mine to help him get a job the next year because he struggled in the playoffs against y'all. Mm-hmm. Your point guard, Yoga Pot, Yoga Pot, young Dutch guy, yep. ended up out him, which was a miracle. Yeah, no, no, it was. Uh, and uh, I got benched, and then y'all put it on us. So we were done. And I said, I'm finished. My career is over. So I, I went to coaching right after that. So literally, like, right, there was no, like, uh, like, like, wait. He was, like, literally went straight from retirement to coaching right away. Well, yeah, that's what happened because when I played in France years before, I was playing, I had a nice career in France. And then I think at 31, I had my first knee surgery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I came back and then like at 32, I had another surgery. And it, I kind of stopped because I, it was, I, I couldn't go. And I wanted to retire and come back. But then the management asked me to stay and be the coach. So I ended up coaching the pro team in France over there. Uh and did well, coached for like a year, and then next year ended up leaving. Then a couple years later, I came out of retirement and played on in Israel and then played in Greece on top teams in Europe. Okay. Europe okay. top teams again, 36, 37. So by the time I came back and went there, I already knew I could coach because I had done it before. Mm-hmm. And I, I usually gave lectures and clinics in basketball and actually gave practices almost every team that ever played with in Europe in my free time. Go practice mm-hmm. with the kids, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So... And weird, I was thinking, okay, if I want to stay in ball, this is a tough adjustment. It's hard, you know. You know, you know about it. I thought I saw that in one of your podcasts. Yeah, no, and no, it people, was hard. People still don't realize how difficult that is, man. It's it's uh, something that nobody really prepares you for. If people can talk about it, and only, only way you do it is experience it. You know, like they don't they don't really know. And it's different for everybody. It ain't easy. And I, even when I was in weird. At the end, I was thinking, okay, I used that year I played to think about what the hell am I going to do, to be honest. And it was like, <laughs> you know, it was like a year and a half, even though I played, like, what the hell am I going to do? Right, to right, re- right. Yeah, so even though I was playing, I was really retired after I left the gym. You know, <laughs> I did with everything everything I could uh, to get ready for the games. But after I left the gym, I was retired. So I think I met you when we were in the club one night talking. Yep. <laughs> yeah, 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 we sure did. And I'm like, look, man, I will buy talk to y'all, y'all good brothers, but up here, I need a drink and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we was, that's a funny story, backstory on that situation. We was like, dude, if we see him, you know, me and Billy, we see, we gonna just ask him all these questions about NBA, whatever, you know? And he was like, young blood, I, I don't mind doing this, but not right now. Let me, let me get a drink. <laughs> let me relax. <laughs> Let's just have a good time. And we was like, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Cause we was like, yeah, oh my god, you know what's going on? How you do it? <laughs> yeah, because that lifestyle is so difficult, and then sometimes it can be really, really hard. Mm-hmm. Then when we go out, we go out. We don't go straight to the head, but we go out to try to find. I know that club was like. I never really went to those kind of clubs when I was in Europe. I went to different kind of clubs in Paris, totally different. Mm-hmm. And when I got there, I had been in Europe so long. And it had been so long since I'd been to an R&B club, even though we got them all over Paris and all that, because I just didn't go there. I just go have a drink somewhere. And I, I never was a big partier. 
Mm-hmm. But I went out a lot after the games because I believe, you know, when your job is over, you're free, you can do what you want. So right. Right. I always got my rest and I was always prepared and I always won. So it wasn't really like burning candles on both ends. It was like you're alive, you're young, you're healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had the period where I sat in the hotel rooms, where I sat in my, my apartment and just watched cassettes of the States. So now I want to get out. Yeah. I don't yeah, want to sit yeah. in no more, you know? You know, uh, life changed. So when that time when I saw you guys, I was like, look, I'm out. And I'm retiring, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm retiring anyway, so I'm right, out. Right, 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 right. I'm going to hang out in the R&B club, see some of the young bucks, hang out a little bit with some of the old folks. And then reminisce because by then I had went full circle. I went mm-hmm. Holland, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and then Israel, Greece, France, Belgium, the Netherlands. So I did a 360. <laughs> you and did. That's literally a 360. I did, I, did, I, did, I did a complete 360. And that's what mm-hmm. I was thinking about during that time. And then I was saying, and now where the hell am I going to go in coaching? So I did a, I did a clinic actually in, in Finland mm-hmm. uh, after that. And from that clinic, they basically offered me a job, the coach. So that's how coaching started oh, right away. Okay. So I was very fortunate. I, I did a clinic, and, and they hired me to be their coach. So, All right. What would you say the I best had, thing about, uh, you know, from I mean, about overseas compared to, like, the NBA? Uh, you know. Well, I used to tell my friends in the league, because it's different now, because, you know, money changes so much. Of you know, course. Money is important, and money has a, a huge effect. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's such a great, huge difference from when I started out. And even Europe, because the money it went, at times in Europe was great. Mm-hmm. And then it changed also. And it depends on the country, depends on the club. Yeah. But I think the best thing was the fact that it wasn't university, but you had a feeling of team and camaraderie, like the university when we ate together and we mm-hmm. traveled together. In the NBA, you're on your own. You go, you're on your own or whatever. Uh, then the, the cultural experiences that you can meet if you spend the time and, and try to understand that first, we're not in America. Everybody don't speak English perfect. They have a different mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't mean it's not good because it's not American. It doesn't mean it's wrong because it's not English or American. Mm-hmm. It's just different. And then sometimes it, it could even be better. And I actually learned how to live in Europe as opposed to when I was in the States, even when you're in the NBA, in university, or a top player in high school, there's always something that you have to worry about on your shoulder when you go out. Right. You, know, yeah. you got relatives yeah. worry about whether you're going to come back home, yeah. uh, especially yeah. when you grow up in the inner city. Yeah. Uh, when you become really good, you worry about what's going to happen because a rivalry across town and you drive down the wrong street in a, in a neighborhood in Indiana. I went down a rural neighborhood. I'm worried about maybe the Klan coming out. You drive down the rural streets in the Netherlands somewhere, and you don't have that feeling. That's true. That is very you know, true. When when you go out at night and you you see guys drinking on the streets or whatever, and you don't see cops pulling guns out trying to shoot you. Mm-hmm. I got stopped by the cops for the first time in Europe, and I'm like, okay. And they just we just stopped for the ID. I said, are you allowed to just do that? He said, well, we can. And I said, well, in America, you got to stop me for a reason. He said, well, we can do that. But don't worry, it's no problem. Just want to say hello, see how you're doing. <laughs> you <know? laughs> okay. And All right. So the feeling of really living in freedom happened for the first time right. outside of America. When people in America always talk about freedom. Mm-hmm. No. It happened the first time outside of America, which was one of the best things. And, you know, I think also another thing is when you see people look at you as you, uh, as you as a person, and then when you play for a top club and a top team, there's real genuine love that you would get when you're in high school, when you're on the top team, or in university when you're with a good university organization. Mm-hmm. In Europe, in Europe, those people are fanatical in some of the places you go, like Italy, Greece. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I got a I got a photo the other day from a guy who's actually a referee. Mm-hmm. And he sent me a photo from like 30 some years ago when he was young. And then two days later, he sent me a photo of his mother and me. And wow. the, you meet people who really, and not that you don't have this in the States, because I do, I, I'm lucky. I grew up in the States where I have wonderful friends from the hood, mm-hmm. best in the world, you know, <laughs> from the hood. I love the hood until I die. And, and I have wonderful people from there, you know, regardless of how their life is and what happens. 
-hmm. But in university, you meet different type of people that you that are that care about you because you help their university, and then they get to know you. But in the Netherlands, or in Holland, or in France, or, or in Greece, or in Israel, once you become part of this little community in town, man, you theirs. Ain't nothing you can do about it. True. You can't, you can't run away from it. You know, and they really make you feel like they're happy that you decide to be part of that club. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is strange because you get that in the States, but it's different. The only bad side is when you lose, the first time ever I lost two games in a row in Europe, I had people turning their head. And in those days, if you lost two games in a row, you got cut. So it took me three years before we lost two games in a row. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, took, it took me three years because I was like, look, I, I need this job. No, no, <laughs> I get that. I hear you on that. That's true. That's 100% true. You know, so it, it's that's the downside, you know, is how people can treat you so good. And then when you lose, treat you like bad. the worst thing yeah. in the world. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. They'll kiss you on both sides of your face. And then they'll start, you keep winning, they start kissing you. The women try almost kissing you in the mouth, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then when you lose, they walk up to you and then turn their head. <laughs> did, you, did you experience that? <laughs> yeah, no, no. When we would lose, um, yeah, like, yeah, it would be like, you know, like, hmm, like a sniff, like, hmm. Like, dang, it's like that. I just, we, we still in second place. I mean, what's yeah. up, you know? We still good. But yeah, we so won. it we definitely, won. definitely we felt that way, you know. We had won like 12 games in a row or 13 games in a row when I was in Denver at one point. And my first game was like a nightmare because I came off the bench and for them. And they were a top team in Europe, so they really didn't need me in a sense. But they had a player before who was getting like 35 a game. And he was killing. So he was one of the top players in Europe. Mm -hmm. But I took his place. He played a guard. He played the wing. And I played like the two and the one for them. But they had a really good point guard. So I played more two. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guys were so good, I didn't need to shoot the ball that much. I was passing the ball and playing defense. But we right. were winning on the road. And sometimes with that guy, they would lose on the road, but they would be big teams right, on the road. Right, right, so, right, right, right. Uh, when I wouldn't get 30, they would look at me like I was crazy. We won like 13 in a row at one point. When the coach comes up to me, Terrence, would you please go out and score 30 points? I said, we win. He said, yeah, but do it. Just do it. So, okay, so I go out and get 40 on the road. I get 40 <laughs> again. And then the coach says, okay, um, can you start passing the ball again? And your teammates like it when you pass the ball. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest thing, like, you know, please go out, score 40, and then you score 40, 40, and then, oh, yeah, we like it when you pass. <laughs> yeah, you know, we still winning, though. But, okay, right. I didn't want to score 40 every night. So right. I was only getting, like, 19 a game, and we're winning every game. So what the hell? We end up winning 21 straight before we lost in the playoffs and then won the championship, but – I still felt like even that year, they wanted the guy to score 30 points a game all the time. Yeah, even if they were losing, which makes no sense. Well, they weren't a losing team, but even if they lost some crucial games at certain points, they didn't care. They just wanted the guy to score 30, and they wanted to win by 30, too. So that was strange. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, pretty picky. Pretty picky. I, I agree with you on that. Based that changed on your... in France, though. That changed in France, though, because oh. in France, whew, in Paris, they loved you. When I say they loved you, I mean... I had more love than you can ever imagine when I played in France. It was greater than the NBA, man. It oh, was better than I imagine. Like, France people, no, they no. passionate. They love their team. They love their team. Ooh, when we were winning, oh, we we went 21 straight, too, I think, one year there, too. I had a lot of streaks when I played in Europe. 21 straight, 12 straight, 9 straight. I think the smallest streak we ever had was, like, 9 straight on most of the teams in the beginning. Right, so, right, right, right. Winning cured everything, man. Yeah. Of course. Now, what I, when I was in, you know, if we won five or six in a row, we was we were like, <laughs> you know, and that was with like two, three games in a week. So we went two weeks without losing. We was good, yeah. like you know what I'm saying. So <laughs> we would win, and they would come in the locker room with champagne after every game. I had to tell the president, "Look, man, stop doing that, man, because you can spend spending a lot of money on champagne." He's like, "They one of our sponsors. I don't care." <laughs> 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 now nah, I got you. So, so I used to give bottles of champagne to the Americans after we beat them, and then say, "Look, meet you in the club, guys. I take care of y'all. We good." <laughs> All right, right. That see, 
That's love. That's a hundred percent love. Uh, based on your like experience, you know, uh, what would be like the best advice for the next you, you know, if, if, if that could be anything? Well, times have changed, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So the only thing I can say is the same advice that I, that I would give to you or anyone else. Mm -hmm. When you go there, I think in general, to sum it up, you know, when my, my son started playing pro ball. My daughter played pro ball. So she played in WNBA for the Sparks. Oh. I go in Minnesota and my son plays in France. He played in, in Italy a little bit. I just sum it up simply like try to go there wherever you go as a professional and try to help the team reach their objectives as possible. At the end of the season, leave with your reputation intact so that someone else is willing to try to take you and hope that they can reach their objectives and stay healthy. Take care of your body mm -hmm. because uh, that's why you're there and if you get hurt, some people can play hurt, but you want to try to maintain your body so you don't get hurt and play as long as possible and enjoy it because uh, you're doing something you love to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Respect the game, huh? you know, basically you respect the game and prepare yourself to play and do whatever it takes to win. It was harder in those days, you know, because now, you know, people want to win, but you can still get a job in a sense when you're a talented player by not winning as much as we had to win to be successful. And I know, uh, in your career, you know, like I said, I, I follow your career and all that. And when you go to teams like Den Boss and Groningen and those places that you play, it's hard, man. It's really hard. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and then you never know what you're going to run into as a coach, huh? because, you know, you could be a talented player and you could help one team win, but another coach just has this other image in his head. He got another agent calling him up every practice, trying to sell him another player. And you know what kind of – you never know what kind of deals they're making. That's true. So, That's one hundred percent true. You know, in a sense, sometimes the worst thing about professional sports is all the people that have an opportunity to play are talented. Yes. The best way to be successful, I found, is when you enable a, a talented player to do the things they're capable of doing on a consistent basis. When you try to make them do something they can't do, most of the time they struggle. When you take their time and their minutes away, most of the time they struggle. So, uh, if you get the minutes. Do the things you're capable of doing. And hopefully you've had somebody, a patient management when you struggle, give you an opportunity to come through it. Because if you don't get an opportunity to uh, continue to do your job when you struggle, you're never really going to get a chance to learn how to survive in this business. And in the NBA, guys that don't get minutes, most of the time they become has-beens. It doesn't mean they can't play. It's just mean they don't get minutes. And if you struggle and you don't get an opportunity to play out, of the struggle, it's going to be hard to be a pro or difficult to do anything you want to do in life because you're always going to struggle. Everybody struggles. Very true. Very, At very some true. point in some time, some point in some time. So you got to have somebody that's confident in you other than just yourself because you might be confident, but if they don't put you on the floor, what can you do? No, if the coach right. don't put you on the floor, there's nothing you can do. That's 100%. And then right. get, get your paper and Try to have your plan together when it comes, regardless of uh, how it comes together. Always think about something else because we can't do this forever, even though we believe it. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's even 100 we, percent true. That's 100 percent true. Even though we believe it, man, we believe that we can do this forever. When you work as hard as you did in your career when you're young. The best advice I got from a guy who played at Duke a long time ago and he came to me and he's like, man, you know, I want to play the NBA my whole life. And I played at Duke, lost in the NCAA tournament championship game, and never got a chance to play in the NBA. And he's thinking, now what am I going to do? He said, man, I'm going to do whatever it can to get paid to play basketball. I'm going to Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> people don't understand that in those days, that was a great opportunity. Right, right. I was probably one of the few guys that went to Europe, and then I got calls from NBA teams, and I said, no, I'm not coming back. Okay, okay. And it was different reasons why, because back in those days, when I came, you had to be reapply as an amateur in order to play in Europe once you play as a professional in the NBA. And this is before the 92 Olympics, where they allow professionals to play in the Olympics. So oh. that means if I went back to the NBA and got in a bad situation and got cut, that means I could never play professional basketball again, even outside of America. So when I got calls, I was like, no, nah, I'm staying in Europe. I know money's guaranteed. The responsibility is much greater than it was in the NBA at that time because you had to play 40 minutes and you had to win. And if you didn't, they sent you home. You yeah. didn't win and you couldn't stay on the court 
in the crucial minutes, they sent you home. So that was harder than any role I ever had in the NBA. Right, 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 right. And it was more challenging in those days. Mm -hmm. And it, it was less teams in the NBA. So, of course, obviously, a lot of top players that weren't in the NBA were in Europe. So it wasn't like now where you got a few hundred more players that would be in Europe. They're in the NBA now. <laughs> That's true. That is very so true. That is very it's true. difficult to explain that. So getting back to that story about John Stockton, when my man said, how the hell are they going to say that you are a bust just because John Stockton ended up being a Hall of Famer? We had the same stats our rookie years. Mm -hmm. Then he got more minutes, and I didn't. But I played, what, 16 years as a professional on top teams in Europe, and a lot of NBA guys were over here. They got sent home after they played against me. <laughs> and, some them, and some of them went back to the NBA. <laughs> so they got sent home back to the NBA. You know, you, you know some, of, some of them went back to the NBA. And some of them got sent home after they played against my team back in the day. <laughs> That's crazy. So, you know, whoever's stupid enough to look at those stats alone and don't know the true story, <laughs> The full story about how hard it is to play. And every time I came home and played in a summer league in a Baker League with NBA guys, I always averaged 30, <laughs> 25, 30. <laughs> I played one year in the LA Summer League. I think I averaged 24 after my first year in the league. So I could play. I ain't worried about nobody saying some stupid stuff we don't know. Get on the court against me back in my prime. <laughs> and right? then see what you got. <laughs> now I got you. Well, <laughs> you know, well, Mr. Sansby, I appreciate it. Man, I appreciate you so much for coming on the show. Um, really means a lot to me, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like I was like, I got to get him on. When he was like, all right, I'm going to come on. And after a couple of weeks, I was like, cool, perfect. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, like I said, I had it. I was like, I got to get you on the OG on, you know? So like I said, I appreciate you coming on the show. You know, um, you know, uh, hopefully I get you on again, you know what I'm saying? And, well, we uh, try to get back with Kendall Mack. He knew more about Dutch ball, and he had a nice experience. Everybody's journey is different. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful journey, and it's a great story to tell your friends and your family and your mm -hmm. grandkids. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you have one, too. But, you know, yours was great as well. But people don't know that because they only see the NBA, and they think the NBA is all. It is all. It's the best in the world right. and the best players in the world. But I knew NBA players could, couldn't average 25 over here in Europe when I played. Oh, that's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. They still went back to the league and played their nine or ten years. Nothing against that. But uh doesn't mean we couldn't play. No, you know? no, I agree with you. <laughs> like, a lot of dudes in the NBA, like, the game is so much different in Europe. Like, you have to really know how to play, like, a different kind of style and many different types of styles in Europe. Like, it ain't like, like, NBA is pretty much one style, you know? Um, yeah, you don't have to adjust as much because you get on the team, you have to adjust to the team and your teammates in the league, which is hard because they're great players every night and high-level right. players. Mm -hmm. But when you go to a team in, in in Greece somewhere and they just walking the ball up the court mm -hmm. and fast break in transition or, you know, you go to France where they got these athletic guards back in the day that are more more athletic defensive-wise than anybody ever played against in university. And right. then you still got to get your numbers against those guys, you know? Mm -hmm. And then how physical it was back in the day in Europe when they used to jump on your back and knock you down. The European Cup games were harder than almost all the NBA games ever played in, except for when the big guys back in the day would try to hurt you or the playoff right. team. Right. But the European Cup games back in those days in the Netherlands, guys, man, they jump on your head, knock you down. The refs don't call fouls. And you still got to find a way to get to 25 to keep your job. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> – the pressure of it, I always felt like the pressure of European basketball was just so much different because, like you said, like you essentially could be like game to game. You know, yeah. like if you, you know, you lose, like you said, lose two games, three games, and they like, well, we might have to bring another American in, you know, yeah. or something like that. I mean, granted, like I said, top players, you know, like yourself, it's like a top money. But, yeah, like they, I remember Doesn't one matter. time my first year I came into France for a trial and they had to do – on a trial, in the middle of his trial, while I came to trial with him, against him. And I'm just like, so that's how I roll? Like, y'all roll like that? I'm like, yeah, I got another dude. I thought I was just trying out for the team, not trying out against the tryout to get on the team. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, it's, it's crazy, but it, it wasn't even just like that in France. And it's not always about money. It depends on the team, the situation. Because I'm going to tell you, I first went to the Netherlands. I only made two grand. 
Right. In the books, even though they had guys making seven, eight, and, and more because they didn't have no money in their budget because they were paying this other guy. And I just wanted to play ball. So I said, I'll take it. I came there with more money than I got paid that year in my <laughs> pocket just in case something happened. <laughs> right. But, you know, I got compensated when I signed my next contract and the other contracts afterwards. Right. But in those days, they did that in the Netherlands. They had two or three guys in practice waiting when a guy struggled because those agents was calling them all the time. You know, these agents are calling guys when they struggle. In France, I mean, agents will call a guy when we, when we lost our first game, even though the team was begging me to sign a new contract every week. Agents were still calling and saying, I got a guy cheaper than Stanford. You know, I remember when a guy came to play for our team, we were in fourth place in the league, and the agent convinced him to cut the second American on our team. We were in fourth place in the league. And this team was begging me to sign a new contract every year. And this guy was a veteran at the end of his career. He had played many years in Italy and then came to France and he didn't like it because it wasn't Italy. Right. And, um, but we were winning. So they bring a guy in who had just left the NBA and he come to practice. He's like, man, we got a squad because he liked the big man. And I said, look, man, that ain't our teammate. If you're here, you're taking this guy's place. He said, what? <laughs> he didn't know. He didn't know. Because there's only two Americans back in those days, and I was right. playing as American. So after the first practice, the veteran had boned him in the mouth, hit him in the face, because he knew the guy was coming to take his job. Right, right, right. And this is a guy coming from the league who had played like two years in the league. And you got an older American who played in Italy in a tough league, just beating him up physically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when practice was over, he went to the manager and said, I'm not practicing more, I'm going back to the States. I said, Why? He said, Because this guy, I'm going to be taking his place, and he's still here. <laughs> right, <laughs> now or whatever, but both of them could play. Mm-hmm. One was just younger, and one was more dynamic. Right, so they end up cutting that guy because the other guy said, "I ain't practicing no more" because they really wanted him. Oh, it's cool. so they end up cutting the big dude. They cut him, and we were a winning team, and That's we end up crazy. finishing in the same position, fourth position. Mm-hmm. And so. People don't know all these stories that you hear and you see in Europe. You know, it, it's it's uh, the NBA is it. It's fantastic. It's great. It's the best. They take care of their players. It's the best money in the world, the best players in the world, the most professional organization in the world. But a lot of guys who came to the league, I remember guys that I played against the league came to Europe and they were like, oh, what is this? The practices two and a half hours a day, twice a day in training camp, running like crazy. You know, <laughs> you no, got to no, eat, yeah, yeah. you know. It was totally different. Huh? It's another world. Agreed. Agreed. Another world. But it was well, still ball. Still ball. You know what I'm yep. saying? But you're right. But like I said, thank you again. And uh, like I, I appreciate, like I said, I got to bring you back on. Like I said, we bring what's name back on. We can just talk about it, yeah. you know, talk about yeah. it again. Um, you can you can catch me uh, on the Believe Network. Shout out to Believe Network. Um, catch me uh, on at Instagram at, at Travis W. Reed. That's R E E D. Um, and on Facebook as well, Travis W. Reed. Um, you know, that's R E E R E E again. Um, you can also, like I said, catch this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio. And you can catch this same episode on YouTube as well. And like I said, we have enough enough programs where you can find us on somewhere. <laughs> okay, I see. I got you. I see that. Yeah. Look, look, man, thank you, my brother, for having me. It's good to see you. Same. Uh, like well. I said. You know, stay well. Um, Give a shout out to all the people in L.A. who don't know me that I played at George Washington Carver High School. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Davis, David Johnson and all the crew back in the day, we had a whip in the Southern League. No, no y'all I, did. Like I said, like y'all did. You know, that's stayed, real talk. Champions of Los Angeles, California, if I had stayed. Right. right. No, y'all would have won. Y'all would have won. I was, I was the missing piece. But <laughs> I went to Delaware where I'm from. And, you know, people in Delaware love me too. And I ended up going to Temple instead of USC. No, nah, it's all good. Know, it's all I good. I was going to be UCLA, though, because when I looked at that team afterwards, uh, they ended up having a guy, Jock Hill, who, who played at Manual Arts, too. He played there a few years in mm-hmm. Carafino those days. Then Wayne Poley went there, but that, I think he left. Uh, so mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. I left. But, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, I let, 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 let me let you give a shout out to you know, like yeah, you know, you, you know, everything that's what you you know what you want to what you want to put out. I know you're pretty private, man. No, but... no, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good, man. No shout outs. Just thank you for being here. Anytime you want me to come on, I'll try to get some Kendall back to come and get some other brothers who play in Europe to come 
chat with you a little no, bit. I love it. I would love it. Any any of them. Because like, I love, like I said, my reason why I started it was for people like yourself. But like, you know, like obviously you played in the NBA as well. But like people who, they don't know the, the overseas stories. They only know the NBA stories. I love to hear the overseas stories. Man, it's a lot of them, man. I, I'm fortunate when I coached, I ended up coaching Gene Banks who played in the league. I coached A.J. English from my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, who played in the league in France. Mm -hmm. I coached a great player, Glenn Stokes from Baltimore in my coaching career. Yeah, played with Michael Brooks and Coach Michael Brooks, who was the captain of the Olympic team in 1980, who passed like six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys were NBA guys in Europe, and then they became European guys. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of like yourself in a way. Like you ain't you might come back to the States. <laughs> but you like, I'll hey, be in Europe, man. I'm chill. <laughs> listen, I just I just came back from Italy, <laughs> chilling in the south of France, hitting Italy again. You know, I don't have I don't have the cops coming after me when I come, go out at night. <laughs> you know, nah, I, you know, I, I get that. that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, you I get it. I get it. I get it. Well, like yeah. I said, thank you once again. I appreciate it. Okay, take it easy, man.